Hello and welcome to this photo skills session. This session is called The Art of Seeing and it's loosely based on a column I write for Digital Camera Magazine that's also called The Art of Seeing. The basic premise of the column is that I write about why I've taken a photograph uh, rather than how I've taken a photograph. So it's less about camera settings and fancy techniques and more about the creative process, the thought process behind an image. And it's been a really enjoyable and useful exercise to do. I, I've spent a lot of my career writing about photography but not often uh, about my own pictures in this way. And I found over the two or three years that I've been doing this that it has really uh, started to inform and change uh, my creative thinking. And while I've been doing this, I've also noticed that there's been certain, uh, certain recurring themes in my work, and I've broken those down into a half a dozen points, which I'm going to highlight here in this presentation, which will hopefully help you on your creative journey uh, in the world of photography. So my first, uh, my first tip, as it were, is to write about your images. Now, it might sound like a bit of a drag, but it really is a useful discipline to learn. I keep a little notebook. Uh, I use Good Notes, which I can use as a digital notebook, which I can use on my iPhone, my iPad, and on my MacBook. And I can kind of pick the information up anywhere, which is really useful when I'm traveling. I can use a pen, which gives the nice organic feel of handwritten notes. I can uh, paste uh, pictures in, paste maps, any kind of location information. I try to put some of the technical information, where it is, what it was, who it, who's in it, if there's someone, what their name was, what the settings were, the date, and, and all that kind of rele relevant information. But more importantly, I try and make a note of some of my thinking behind what, what, what was I responding to when I was there. The questions I try and ask myself is, what is it? What, am, what is the photograph of? Why have I photographed it? And why have I photographed it in this way or processed it in this way? Why have I made it black and white and so forth? Um, and I think if you try and answer those questions and think about your photography, uh, it will ultimately uh, fuel the creativity in your work and you'll start to see uh, your, your kind of creative identity mature. Uh, you may have heard journalists talk about the five W's and this is kind of day one of journalism school where journalists are encouraged to uh, think, about a, uh, think about the five W's, the wh who, what, where, why and when. And the idea is that you get this information into the first sentence or two of a news story um, that you're going to cover. And this is uh, uh, useful, just keep those five W's in the back of your mind uh, when you're photographing and ask yourself those questions uh, and make a mental note uh, and then make a physical note when you get, when you, when you get back uh, to keep your creativity on track. So my second point is to look for beauty in the banal. And I've put this as a, as a, as a point because I think it's really important and something that I feel that people that are possibly new to photography uh, um, sometimes get uh, caught in the trap of engaging with uh, photography by appointment only, uh, usually at the weekend with the idea that it has to be a honey spot uh, location at the magic hour and so forth. So really what I'm suggesting in this, uh, in, in this section is to engage in photography every day and everywhere, whether you live in a, a rural environment, a wild environment, an urban environment, uh, or just in the suburbs, everywhere has rich potential to make interesting photographs and so I would really encourage you to uh, explore your, 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 your local areas with a camera and a keen eye. I really like this quote by Nietzsche who says there are those who know how to make much out, out of little and a majority of those who know how to make little out of much. So if you uh, explore your local neighbourhoods and you learn how to see with a keen eye and, and appreciate beauty and learn to look and learn to look hard and start to see, when you do find yourself in these amazing honey spot locations, you will find the visual process uh, all much, much easier and you'll be able to give it your own uh, input rather than just replicating what somebody else might have already done before. 
So I'm going to share a couple of examples here and uh, we're going to look at some pictures uh, that I've made on my travels that probably speak to this a little bit. So here is an image that doesn't uh, um, get much more banal, really. It's a, a rundown, uh, mouldy, old kitchen sink on the side of the street um, somewhere in Southeast Asia. I was working uh, some workshops and the, and the location was um, disappointingly unphotogenic and uh, we were all struggling to find uh, any decent images. Um, but after a while and after looking hard, we managed to find that, that pictures started to present themselves everywhere. And this is a good example, I think. And by stopping and making a considered composition, so it's not a quick, casual snapshot, uh, uh, through the composition and the deliberate arrangement of the verticals and the shapes and the colours and the tones and the textures of the image, I'm elevating uh, this banal uh, little corner into something a little bit more aesthetically pleasing. And a little bit closer to home, this is an underpass I run under here pretty much every day and it's, it's just where I live but I just over time began to appreciate the beauty of this uh, concrete pillar and the under, underbelly of this, of this flyover and just uh, enjoyed the textures and the tones and the lights and feel that again I managed to find some, some beauty in this very, very banal scene. The harder you look, the more you will see. And here's, a, here's another good example, I think. So this uh, is a seemingly exotic location in Costa Rica, but as you can see, it's a particularly dull day, and I'm just on the fringes of a semi-industrial port area, and as you can see, there's really not that much that's, uh, uh, that seems obviously photo photogenic. But look at the three palm trees on the left-hand side there, and if I just click to the next picture. Those are the same three palm trees, just reimagined in a new way. It was convenient that the, the little boat managed to just come in at the right time. But these two pictures, if I flip between the two, are taken within 10 minutes of each other. But by just having a different frame of mind, changing my viewpoint, changing a lens, maybe reimagining it as a black and white image, it's, a, it's an image with a very, very different uh, feel to it. And then lastly in this section, uh, it doesn't get much more banal than um, the corner of your bathroom. And this is uh, my loo in lockdown. And uh, as I was exploring my domestic space uh, in the lockdown, uh, I uh, began to find uh, little moments of aesthetic joy all over the place. And especially here in the corner of the loo as the light is coming through, uh, a, a, a toilet duck and a bottle of bleach have been elevated by observing the light and photographing it in that way. So that's my second, second point, uh, is to uh, engage in photography every day, everywhere, and look for beauty or making interesting images uh, in, in everyday, seemingly banal situations. The third section that I want to talk about is adding a little bit of depth to your images so that they are a, a little bit more multi-dimensional. So I like to think about photography as a language. So uh, as you learn to write, you learn how to spell words, you learn how to uh, use grammar, you learn how to structure sentences and paragraphs and so forth, and then you, you have a vocabulary with which you can express yourself. So. Uh, you can choose to be a, a poet, uh, a, a journalist, or a novelist, or so forth. But photography is very similar too. So you learn the language. Uh, in some of the other photo skills sessions, you will have learnt about apertures and shutter speeds and techniques and so forth. And they will give you the skills and the language. And then, as a photographer, it's then when you go out into the world, how you, uh, how you choose to express yourself with that language. Are you a poet? Are you a photographic uh, equivalent of a poet. In fact, this very morning I heard Dwayne Michaels call it a foet, which is a, a photographic poet, which I thought was quite uh, interesting. Um, uh, and it's, 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 it's a really good way to add more dimensions to your images. There's a really uh, interesting photographer called Robert Adams, uh, no relation to Ansel, and he was one of the New Topographics, which was a bunch of photographers in the 1970s that produced some really interesting work, uh, coincidentally also about banal sort of landscapes uh, in, 
in America. But uh, Robert Adams um, suggests uh, that good landscape photographs uh, can work on three levels, uh, or successful, successful landscape photographs work on three levels. And he cites those three levels as being geography, autobiography, and metaphor. And by geography, he's talking about a mere record of a place, the, the topography, the light, the weather, uh, and so forth. Uh, by autobiography, he's talking about uh, why, uh, how you as the photographer are responding to that place. What is, what is that sense of place that you are feeling and how can you incorporate that into your picture? And by metaphor, he's, he's talking about how this could take on an alternative meaning. Um, and he suggests that uh, any one of these uh, independently of each other can be a little bit boring. So geography by itself could just be a record shot, just a pretty picture, uh, a one-dimensional picture. You see this a lot with honey spot pictures, uh, pictures of honey spot locations. They can be a bit shallow and one-dimensional because they're just sort of record shots. Autobiography by itself can be a little bit self-indulgent. Look at me, look at me, this is all about me. And metaphor could be, uh, could be uh, taken as being a little bit arty-farty and a little bit pretentious. But Robert Adams suggests bring all three together and you can start making some interesting pictures. So I'm just going to talk about some here, and they're not necessarily saying that they, they capture all three, but that's what I strive for in most of, my, uh, most of my work. So themes that underpin my work as well are, are, are themes around the humanity's uh, relation with the environment, um, and so this was, this were for me works on, on a couple of levels in that it's a record shot. It says something about my thoughts with the uh, uh, man's humanity's relationship with, with, with nature and so on. Here's another, here's another shot that was also, it's a landscape image. Uh, it speaks to me about isolation. It was taken during uh, lockdown. Um, so it speaks on a personal level, it speaks on a, on a sort of uh, a topographic level and perhaps is a metaphor too for, for other states of mind. This heavy sky in Snowdon, uh, in Snowdonia in North Wales, mixing with the, uh, the, with the ridge line of the glitters there on the devil's kitchen could be loaded with, uh, with alternative meanings and my personal sense of place with that area as well as being a record shot. And on a more optimistic note, possibly this blossom reaching for the, the, the mass of light at the top of the screen could be seen uh, as a metaphor for something else. These dying tulips uh, bathed in light are very different from these dying tulips, which are uh, in a harder, contrasty light. Uh, both the same vase of tulips in pretty much the same place, but very evo uh, evoking very different um, feelings. And then introducing uh, techniques like uh, intentional camera movement, for example, uh, is, is another way to add uh, dimension to your work. I think it's important here to mention that, that the techniques really should be to add something to the picture rather than just for the sake of the technique. So in this, in this image, the, the, the movement maybe speaks to the, to, the darker, to the darker mood I was feeling at the time and uh, it gives a sort of impressionistic uh, feeling. And then humour and narrative can also uh, play in as well. There's a story behind this picture which is interesting uh, and it's a little bit of, there's a little bit of element of humour as this uh, old fellow on his mobility scooter is chased along the seafront by, uh, by these bushes. And also your point of view can be interesting. So this image here of a glacier in Alaska, it's all very well, it's a nice record shot, it's quite pretty and so forth. But by literally changing my point of view and taking one step back, this was taken within a few minutes, I can change the narrative, change the story, change the viewpoint, and I can make a very different kind of image that could be loaded with lots of different meaning. So again, just flitting between these two images which were taken within a few moments of each other, you can communicate, you can use the language which I referred to at the beginning of this section, session, section to, to make a very different kind of photograph. So one's not necessarily better or worse than the other, it's just what you want to say as a creative individual. So, if that's all got a bit heavy, now we're just going to celebrate uh, um, some, the spirit of experimenting and um, finding joy in photography. 
and it is important. And I think after, after my whole life being around photography, I still get a kick out of playing with lenses, optics, fancy techniques, chemicals, and all sorts of weird stuff. So, uh, and they all play into, uh, into your creative toolbox. They add to your creative repertoire so that when you are out in the landscape or, or photographing portraits and you want to be uh, more considered, you have, you have the tools to, go to, 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 to call on. So I'm going to just run through a couple of images here and just talk um, quickly and briefly about them. This is a pinhole image. It was made using a sheet of 5x4 film that was cross-processed, so it's putting the colour film through the wrong chemistry, which uh, accentuated the saturation and the contrast of the image. This is the camera I used. It's just a box. It just literally is a wooden box with no lens. So it's amazing that you can create this from just that. It's a wooden box. Multiple exposure is another fun ex uh, uh, um, technique to play with. This is some stones from a beach that I brought back into a little home studio that I have on a light box, in camera, multiple exposure, played well. And then out in the field, multiple exposure uh, of some trees, a dozen or so photographs layered on top of each other to try and capture a sensation of the wind. And uh, this can play into, into, other, into other parts of your work. Here, using flash at twilight uh, and in the rain, which would be uh, an unusual combination of, um, of techniques, but it creates a really interesting uh, image and effect, in my opinion. It's an image as well that could, it could not be realized in any other way other than by, uh, through photography and by using the flash. And if you develop over time through practicing and experimenting, you, you develop a kind of camera vision so that these that you know how something is going to look before you take it. I like to play around with focus and challenge some of the conventions of photography too. So this image is of a red dot but thrown completely out of focus. And I like the fact that sometimes people challenge me and say, this is not a photograph. And I'm like, well, it's made with a camera, so it's a photograph. Um, but I like the abstraction and, and playing around with that. Here's a 3D image I was messing around with, just taking two pictures next to each other and then marrying them together in layers. I really like the red cyan offset look that you get just from this picture, but put some 3D glasses on and then it jumps into, jumps into life and actually becomes a real 3D image. That's really good fun to play with. Here's some old pictures that I found in the attic when I was moving recently uh, of some birds I had shot uh, and I'd, no, I'd just shoved them in the attic, but they, are, they had become sort of uh, mouldy and stuck together, and, but I quite liked some of, the, some of the defects you got. So I re-photographed them on a light box. I also collect sounds as I go on my travels. So I reimagine this, I hit play in a second, and uh, I reimagine this with the, with, with the sound of, um, go, of uh, cicadas in Greece in, a, in an olive, go, olive grove, which made a kind of a, a slightly haunting Hitchcockian uh, fast-paced gif, which I'll just play now. So just another way to reimagine uh, re your images. So my last, uh, my last tip, as it were, is to encourage you to think about your image making in terms of projects. Try and get out of, the, uh, uh, out of thinking of making individual images. Get away from the, the traditional classifications, of, usually by genre, of, of landscapes, people and places, buildings, travel and so forth. Um, they're relatively meaningless in my opinion. But uh, think about projects and working on projects big and small. Some can be meaningful, some can be short and trivial and quick and fun to pr produce, but um, some can rumble on for years, some can be short and quick. So I'm going to run through a couple here. Here's uh, a set of pictures, and this is just one or two pictures that I'm going to show you, but I have, uh, have potentially I have hundreds from this set. I travel a lot, I'm often on a ship, so I always try and photograph the sea in the same way. I always put the horizon dead centre in the middle and uh, frame up in exactly the same way. And it's, it's the repetition, it's the, it's the repetition that makes it uh, an interesting, uh, to me, project. Uh, it's slightly derivative of, of other photographers' work. Uh, Sugimoto, for example, does a lot of, lot of this, but what the hell, I, I'm, I, I'm still enjoying it. So you can see here, by keeping the horizon level, 
uh, it gives a consistency to the project. And here's a little sequence I made which just highlights that point. So that's, so that's one little project which just rumbles on in the background. Every time I find myself on a ship, I, I, I add to that collection. Um, but uh, they, not all projects have to be like that. This is a set of pictures that I just set myself a challenge, and this is something I would uh, encourage you to do as well. This is just a walk uh, that I did, a 10K walk from uh, a town near where I live to back to where I live. And I just decided to take a picture every uh, 200 meters or so. So I was taking, uh, you know, uh, five or so pictures every kilometer. Uh, and it was interesting because it just challenged me to stop and take a picture and react to, uh, to, react, to, react to exactly where I was. Um, here's a little, here's a little quick, um, uh, quick fire um, representation of the journey uh, in this little kind of gif type thing. But uh, it, it was just a project that I was able to do very very quickly. It was done in a couple of hours or three or four hours, an afternoon, um, and actually could make quite an interesting project in its own right. Consistency is important. So these were some portraits I made in, in Miami. And so I'll just show you two or three here. But uh, again, making a stylistic decision at the beginning of the project uh, just reinforced the points I wanted to make about life on this particular street uh, in, in Miami. Uh, using ring flash, but the, the styles were very the style was very similar. If I just flick through, you can see that it feels like a consistent body of work. And then uh, some of my longer form projects uh, I have here, where I'm concerned with um, uh, humanity's uh, environment, uh, a relationship with the environment, and so forth. So I spend a bit of time in Alaska and on travels. And so everything in, in informs these projects. And I just talk, I'll just quickly go through here. Here's this pi picture again, which, uh, which speaks, to, to, speaks to our relationship with nature. Uh, I, I, like, I like the way that the, the, the glacier feels like it's almost melting through the swathe of humans in the, in the middle. The trees in this image turning away from the man-made structure. The wolf that's been turned into a $2,000 rug and more subtly the, the ripples of the water in a, what seems like a beautiful and tranquil scene but taken from, uh, taken from a cruise ship which is possibly part of the problem and then seduced by the colours. But these all inform uh, part of my overall uh, projects. Um, some are big, some are small. So in summary, I would suggest one, you write about your photographs. Two, you take photographs every day and everywhere. You embrace the banal and your locations and discipline your eye and learn to look. Third, use the language of photography to add layers of meaning. And it doesn't mean that everything needs to be highfalutin art school stuff, but just think a little bit more about what you're saying and what you could potentially say, because it comes a little bit more interesting uh, on your photographic journey that way. Fourth, experiment and embrace the joy of a photography. And by doing this, you're also adding to your creative toolbox so that when you uh, are, are playing with ideas, you have, you have the, um, the resources to call on. And fifth, and finally, just work on projects. Think beyond the, be, beyond the individual image and think on making project-based work. Thank you.